No, no. So, so for instance, on voice and democratic accountability, Turkey is positive between 98 and 2008. Say that that dozen years is positive, but it's in the yellow area because it's not large enough to be considered significant, as opposed to what happened in Indonesia, Sierra Leone, and Serbia or in the wrong direction in the Thailand, Venezuela, Madagascar, Zimbabwe. So one can also do this type of analysis over time. But because it's already a dozen years, it's not all trends asking the question whether things went either up or down. There are countries with reversal in either direction. So, for instance, okay, in the case of government effectiveness, the quality of government effectiveness, in the case of Georgia, it's a steady improvement. In the case of Zimbabwe, it's a steady deterioration. In the case of Afghanistan, goes up at first and then it's a deterioration. So one can also analyze trends where they are, they are a, a reverses. The, this type of approach, an empirical analysis allows, as I hinted already, to go well beyond just analyzing corruption. So the whole issue of voice, democratic accountability, freedom of the press, human rights, is also a part of, of the set and part of the analysis. Here, this is a, a world map in terms of voice and democratic accountability. Uh, <coughs> are, one can go at the individual data set, and I don't want to spend much time on this, but one of the one of the drawbacks of dealing at such an aggregate level with our worldwide governance indicators, which are aggregate, only six indicators, is that one cannot drill down and, and ask much more specific questions in terms of, of, a, of a data set. Well, what's the component of human rights in voice and democratic accountability, for instance? Well, in the web, we can drill down and go to the disaggregated data source. So we're the first in saying, don't just stay up in the cloud at the aggregate level. You're interested in one country and want to do more analysis in the website, in the country of interest, you can generate all the individual disaggregated data that we use to generate the aggregate. So here there's one, one such individual data set for human rights where we see, just trust me, um, that the trends worldwide have been quite mixed. So we cannot claim enormous successes overall. Just like in governance, the trends have been very mixed. Some countries have improved, others have deteriorated. It's a lot have been in the modern middle with some reversal. So on average, we do not see over the past 12 years a major improvement on many of these dimensions of governance. Take you were talking about voice, democratic accountability. Let's take one disaggregated data. Let's press freedom in the world, according to freedom, the Freedom House, which is one of, one of our sources. If we look at the world, basically, in, in the 90s, <coughs> on the left, on the late 2000s, and now we have 2009, it hasn't changed, but I need to, to update this slide. We see basically the same pie. One third, one third, and one third. One third of the world has full press freedoms, relatively speaking. One third has only partial press freedoms, and one third no press freedoms at all. So it's not, you know, we always tend to claim success that countries have been growing, and in other areas, in technology, obviously, there have been major progress. But on some of these uh, governance areas, that's not, not uh, the case. And this matters, if we link, press freedoms with control of corruption. Obviously, where there is more sunshine and these issues of transparency and press freedom are very important for control of corruption. So, um, so the, these issues are matter and that's why it's important to, to link them together. More recently, obviously, we're all being very concerned and worried what's happening in the whole region of the Middle East, um, where many experts, we. I wrote a bit about that, where I summarize what the great experts on ma many of the Middle East were writing right at the time that Tunisia demonstrations were happening, then Tunisia government falls. And the number of articles in the most prominent publication, Time, Newsweek, by the main expert, foreign policy, and so on suggesting no domino effect can take place after Tunisia and certainly not Egypt and giving all the reasons 
why Egypt and all the other countries are different. Of course, every country is different. But I was at the time focused, of course, in our indicators, and I look at the data. I'm not a great expert on every country in the Middle East, but I look at the data, and I notice that with the exception of Turkey, in fact, in basically almost, and West Bank and Gaza, interesting enough, um, almost every other country in the region had not only had a very challenged level in terms of democratic government deficit, but it had come very much in the wrong direction during the whole past decade, which I didn't see mentioned. In, in many places. Everybody knew that the levels were bad, but almost everywhere. And it's not each Egypt and Tunisia quite, in terms of statistically, is a tie. They were very similar, and in both cases, moving in the right direction. By, by the way, the top one again, the very dark one, is late at the end, towards the end of the decade, and the yellow is uh, the beginning of, of the decade. So even just paying more attention to the data, not that it's a perfect predictor, but it could have informed some of these uh, pundits, as we call it, and policy analysts that would write very long pieces without a single piece of data. We, I, you can tell, I'm biased towards the power of, of, um, of, of, of data. In fact, at the time, also, we were very concerned about the issue of foreign aid and so on. We, being in Washington, that's an important subject. So. I also showed in one of these articles this very simple graph that drew quite a bit of debate and comment. Voice and democratic accountability, Egypt ranked very, very low forever, and not only that, but going downhill. All through the period, development aid, and I'm not talking even about military aid, just development aid from the development, official development donor community, total, US, Europe, and so on, just increasing. Uh, so they, I think the, the, the data, at least, and, and just showing it simply sometimes puts policy questions to the fore in, in very clearly. This leads to the last uh, part that I want to talk about before getting to just some, um, some concluding points for discussion. And that's the P word. And I know that some of you know much more than I do about the P word. But basically, remember I mentioned the C word. In the World Bank, we could not write the C word and spell it out completely, like, which was corruption, so we would call it the, the C. In, by my late years at the World Bank, and still until today, it's a D word, because politics. Okay? Um, so I'll, I won't have a full fledged analysis of this, but let me just and show the interface with the empirics in one dimension of politics, where politics and high-level corruption basically uh, meet. And that's what, uh, what we have called with my colleague, a uh, former colleague and, and former academic, Joel Hellman, state capture. So essentially, forever, the work on, on corruption, in terms of writings of corruption and, uh, and a particular world of corruption, has focused on bureaucratic or administrative or relatively petty forms of corruption, which are much easier to, to measure and to write about, paying for those licenses. The, what, the, the graph I had shown early on with the table from Ukraine and Russia. But those are raw hanging fruits. That's relatively easy to do. That does not mean that those are the most important forms of corruption. The grand corruption, and one particular form, that we tried to get at with a specialized survey, and that's what's shown here for the former socialist countries, is about the extent of state capture. Essentially, it is basically the, the purchase and undue influence by the elite private of the private sector, by the corporate elite, of the rules of the game that govern them. It's a, the illegal bribes or undue influence or other means to shape the policies, the regulations, and the laws of the state for the benefit of, of the few. When an oligarch basically manages to get a complete monopoly or a, 
basically acquire the whole industry uh, by <coughs> through through their own influence and, and, and money. And we um, and this is one example we did it by by asking in terms of the purchase of influence or parliamentary legis legislation, the increased central banking influence, other forms too. This is in the in the late nineties by the by the way. And we found very interesting. It's not that everything is under enormous capture. There were some countries in transition that were undergoing enormous capture, the Russians, the Ukraine, the Azerbaijans and so on, many in the former Soviet Union, while the more Eastern and Central European, by and large, were going through a more competitive and uh, um, approach towards a market uh, um, economy. And we found this uh, other graphs are not going to show, but we found that this matters enormously for the growth of the private sector in terms of the rate of growth. Corporate elite, the financial industrial conglomerates and so on, can unduly influence the the decrease the laws, regulations, and policies for their own benefit through legal or illegal campaign financing or through other means, through their basically political contacts and political power. So we also had that type of dimension. Or the more subtle, what we call sometimes legal corruption uh, or, or, or state capture. Whoops, we, get, we got a completely different picture. This is meat. 2000s, and we find that about 70% say that's the case in the United States. I still remember around that time, during the Bush era and so on, when presenting these results, everybody would tell me that these corporations which are answering this are, must be totally lying, must be totally wrong. Once the, finan the Wall Street financial crisis and global financial crisis hit, nobody uh, says that they were lying and not reporting right, but it was very interesting. And I think the North has come out much lower, although it's an issue and so on, so there were very significant differences. In fact, the US was among all the richer countries, the, world government, right? the only one that would compete with the US was, was Italy and so on. So then Europe in general was less than in, in, the, in the US, and the ones who were above the US a bit were the Russians and so on, the ones that you could, you could expect. So, it, this I wanted to, to share with you here today because I know that you are in the interface of between economics and politics and to suggest that, that uh, these issues of data power and measurement and working with technocratic issues like, like at the micro level and on firms and so on is not just important to us the traditional economic and financial questions but one can get quite a bit of mileage by asking about some of these political governments and related dimensions. Um, in sum, then, um, you, you have heard to so just very quickly the issue of, of variation is very important in governance and corruption issues around the world, around, uh, uh, between countries, institutions. This, the fact that this variance is a gold mine for us uh, researchers, obviously. Corruption is not in itself the fundamental driver of all ills, and that's why it's important to look at it in this broader governance uh, uh, context. So understanding governance weaknesses is very important. It matters for development, but also it matters for some financial system worldwide. We show it with a, with a public finance link before Greece and so on, and we saw it now on the financial side with the capture in the United States. And, and related. So these issues of governance mattering is well beyond a development problem alone. The importance of transparency is something that, as, as you know, I, I, I stress to be transparent and precise about imprecision in the data. The good news is that there are methods to be precise about imprecision. Therefore, one can make inferences and distinguish between what one, one can infer and interpret and what cannot. And uh, then the last two thoughts on this is the importance of the what we call the demand side of governance, basically the voice and democratic accountability. Not only the, the public sector government institutions issue, often uh, good governance.